Here we go. Okay, we're going to start the lecture. Um, I'm sorry we're, that I've misjudged how much material we can get in a 45-minute lecture, but let's uh, push on. And uh, you should play around with the uh, Brownian motion and orstein uhlenbeck simulations. We'll give you a much better feel for uh, what kinds of processes we're talking about here. And they're, they're going to be essential to everything that happens from now on in, uh, for the rest of the uh, rest of the course today and tomorrow and the day after. What I want to cover right now is the issue of what happens when there are multiple characters. And of course, it's more of the same with matrices, but also I want to discuss what forces are really acting on these characters. We've talked about genetic drift and there's been discussion of chasing peaks uh, and selection, but I wanted to, to put this into a, a slightly broader framework. Um, and the, the first thing you can say is that if you have one character and Brownian motion, and you go for twice as long time, you get twice as much variance. You just add up the variances. Well, the same thing happens with Brownian motion with multiple characters. With, um, with multiple characters, uh, each character is changing according to some kind of Brownian motion with its own variance. The different characters would have different variances. Furthermore, the characters co-vary, and I'll, I'll be going over, I'll, I'll be giving a, a slightly broader picture of why they co-vary, but they co-vary basically because of, of issues of selection as well as issues of genetic co-variation. The result is, in, a, in one generation, the characters change in a co-varying fashion. They can be regarded as drawn from a normal distribution with some, me some variances and co-variances. And if you go T generations, it's in, you simply multiply as, as at least a first approximation, you can just consider it to be Brownian motion, and you multiply, and so you'll get a covarying Brownian motion with multiple characters. And that's really not a particularly surprising result. And when you look on a tree, you get results also exactly parallel to what you get for a single character. You get a change. Now, here is... What we're imagining, you have to be a little careful here, we have a tree that has two tips that are called two and three. And the uh, uh, common ancestor is called one. But now we're considering two different characters. I'm calling them X and Y. They have nothing to do with sex chromosomes. Um, they're just variables. And they're both going to be changing. And X is going to be showing a random change in this branch and then a random change in, in the branch 2 and a random change in branch 3. Y is going to be doing the same. But I'm going to consider a case where we measure, in order to get the general pattern, I'm going to consider a case where we happen to have observed X in this species and Y in that species. The reason I'm doing it is to figure out what the general pattern is so I can show you how the, everything co-varies. So what we're considering is the change of x in this branch, the change of x in that branch, the change of y in this branch, and the change of y in branch 3. Okay. So if you consider those and then you just think about what things are independent from each other, everything that happens in two different branches is independent under our scheme. Um, things that happen in the same branch in different characters might not be. So what we have is a sum, delta x1 plus delta x2 in the, in the x character, delta y1 plus delta y3. Remember, we're measuring it in, in species 3, not species 2. So you have that covariance. If you expand it out, you get all four possible covariances, this with this, this with that, this with this, and this with that. All of those are in different branches except for the change of x and the change of y in the same branch, branch 1, the common ancestor branch. Okay. So if you do that, what you find is that the covariance of different characters in different species is the product of the 
the branch length to their common ancestor multiplied by the covariance of the characters per unit branch length. So it's just like what I showed you before where you had a, a matrix V times P, only now the covariation of these two characters in these two species is the, the covariation that they would have in their shared, their shared evolution up to the common ancestor. So when you do that, you get a general pattern that uh, the covariance is the shared time times the, the per unit, the shared branch length times the per branch length covariation of the character. Okay. Uh, and one thing you can do, now this is just going to be algebra, uh, a bunch of algebraic notation. So if you tend to be uh, alienated by that, you can let it go by. Um, if I take all of the data, I have p characters. So I've got, say, 20 characters. And I have a bunch of species. I've got 100 species. Well, that's 2,000 data points. What we can do to make nice matrix algebra is stack up the vectors. So here is for species 1, the p characters. And here's for species 2, the p characters. We can just, this is a x transpose, so this, the vector I'm, I'm imagining making is actually a column vector. And it's a stack of all the stuff for the first species over all the, the p characters for the first species and the p characters for the second. So it's just notation, it's just bookkeeping. But we can make a vector that represents all of our data. And then we can ask um, what the covariance matrix for that big 2,000 long vector is. And technically what it is, something called the Kronecker product of T and V. That's, again, it sounds like I'm using some terribly sophisticated theorem, theorem but it's actually just bookkeeping. Um, it's saying that we're going to have a matrix which will consist of blocks. And these blocks will be these, the covariance matrix of the, of the changes of the characters. And there's a whole bunch of these blocks. And they're multiplied each by the shared branch length, or shared time if you're doing it in time, between, say, the here's for species 1 and species 2. It's T1, 2, the shared stuff on the tree times the covariation of those characters. So anyway, you can use Kronecker products. Paul actually did use a Kronecker product in his, in his notation uh, to get this giant 2,000 by 2,000 matrix in, in our example. And I guess let me not go through all the algebra except to say it then turns out that the likelihood for the whole works is just a multivariate normal likelihood. But here it is written in this Kronecker notation. Now, I showed you earlier this contrast process where you can go on a tree and you can pull off two species at a time, two tips at a time, leaving behind a fictional tip, which is the average of the two, a weighted average of the two. And you, keep, you can keep doing this. And you can, on a tree of 100 tips, you can pull off 99 of these two species trees. You can decompose it into 99. So you can work out a set of contrasts that give you variables that are independent. And the way that comes in here is just to say we can make up a matrix of the set of contrasts. And if you work it through all the, the algebra and say, well, what's the distribution not of the original data, but of the contrast, the data made into contrast, you get this thing, which looks terrible, but really all it says is that it's a multivariate normal distribution, but now those things are independent. And they have equal variances. And that's what this Kronecker stuff here means. It, by the way, also adds to the likelihood a little penalty function for uh, the variances of the contrast. In many cases, we talk about that's not going to matter. It's just going to be, it just depends on the tree and not on the data. And uh, if we're going to keep the same tree, uh, it's just a constant. Uh, in, in effect, it's a constant. There are some other cases where it isn't. OK. So you go through all this, and you say, well, um, if I take a tree, and I get the set of contrasts, then I can write 
the likelihood as a function of our unknown covariance matrix among the characters and a sum of squares matrix of the contrast. In the exercise this afternoon, you'll actually be computing um, the sum of squares matrix and the estimate. And you can from that make an estimate of the, um, the covariance matrix. And what you end up with is interesting fact that the likelihood in that situation is just a function of the log of the determinant of your estimate of the covariance matrix. That's actually, people working with multivariate statistics often find uh, that result. Well, um, Can I? yeah, this is just to show you the algebra for a moment, and then I'm going to shift into the question of what the biological forces are. I think Steve wants to rescue me by uh, bringing some reality in here. No? Uh, maybe a rescue. I just wanted to. I just wanted to cross reference to Paul yesterday. So yeah. So um, yeah, that would be good. He didn't do this transition to independent contrast, and I That's gather right. he did that because he had the G matrix, which could be used to solve for the covariances. Um, what were they? I guess big S. As what as, what was he that was the covariance matrix he had. Yeah, I think I think yeah. Matrix. This is a very good time to bring this up because. What we can do, when you take the contrast, you get independent things. You can then estimate the covariance matrix um, and without, you, you've escaped from the, the, the uh, non-independence that was on the tree and now you can make a rather simple estimate of the covariance matrix by just, just doing ordinary multivariate statistics. That's what this is saying. In Paul's case, he was estimating, in effect, the covariance matrix between species and comparing it to G and his various hypotheses, correct me if I mischaracterize this, uh, were just ways of saying is it, um, is, it, is it equal to what you expect? Is it a, a multiple of that? Does it have changes in the, the, the eccentricity? Does it have rotations, etc.? So he was comparing the, this, which would be the between species the, the estimate of the covariation you've got in evolution along the tree, comparing that to what you would expect from pure genetic drift process, um, you know, based on your genetic experiments. And that's actually a very good bridge to the next slide, which brings biological reality back in. Um, does somebody... Uh, does Hohen Lohen agree with that? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm actually going to show one of the same equations that, that Paul showed here um, and get back to the question of, okay, if you can use this multivariate machinery with contrasts, or there are ways of doing it without. I should say there's a thing called the phylogenetic least squares by Alan Graffin that he uh, published in 1989 which is an equivalent machinery without doing the contrast. It just uses the multivariate normals and it makes maximum likelihood estimates. And by the way, in, in the straightforward cases, the two give you exactly the same numbers. So it's not like they're, um, that you have to worry about which to use you, whatever's convenient. Um, okay, I want to get back to the question of what causes change in quantitative characters. Uh, we're approximating things by Brownian motion We've rationalized it in terms of genetic drift. Um, we've got the, that the variance you expect from genetic drift is the variance of the change in, the, in, the, in, the, in a single character is the additive genetic variance divided by n. Okay. And this, this goes back really to Sewell Wright. I mean, Sewell Wright is the one talking about the variance among inbred lines had exactly equivalent results to this. Paul mentioned that you can also throw in mutation. You can say, well, suppose there's genetic drift and there's a mutation occurring. Then the, the additive genetic variance, which we've been treating kind of as a constant, it would actually be reduced by random genetic drift. Random genetic drift gradually fixing alleles will reduce additive genetic variance by, I mean, to reduce it by a predictable amount, 
by multiplying it by 1 minus 1 over 2n, where n is the population size or the effective population size. But mutation is also occurring, introducing new variation. And Paul had exactly this equation, in effect, um, that the, the expectation of your next generation's additive genetic variance is just this thing. And one thing we often do is to say, well, we don't know what the additive genetic variance will be in future generations, and it'll be somewhat stochastic, but maybe there is an approximate balance between the reintroduction of variation by mutation and its elimination by um, genetic drift. And so when you have drift and mutation, people often will say, well, the net outcome of this will be that our, genetic, that our additive genetic variation will be about the same. That might be true if a population has been there for a very long time and its additive genetic variance has come to equilibrium under this process. Keep in mind, though, that if instead you have a population that was there for a very long time and then suddenly part of it is taken off and goes to an island, now it's got an amount of genetic variation that's not, would not be the equilibri equilibrium level on that island. Um, and uh, you have to start worrying uh, in cases like that. Although, uh, well, that's, that's, that, I, there are complications I can bring up, but let me not. Uh, okay, that's a single trait. Uh, oh, and by the way, if, before we get to multiple traits, if you do the calculation as to what the equilibrium would be under um, mutation, you find that the, the expected um, <coughs> additive genetic variance should be 2n times the mutational variance. So basically, with genetic drift eliminating 1 2 nth of the variance each generation, and that being replenished by mutation, the equilibrium you get is that the genetic, the additive genetic variance present there, um, which this is also G, uh, the notation is differing between Steve and Paul and I, uh, this is the G, is 2n times the mutational variance. In other words, <coughs> it's the total mutational variance <coughs> that would accumulate in 2n generations. So if there's a thousand, if a population of size a thousand, it's two thousand generations worth of mutation. Uh, if it's of size a million, it's two million generations worth of mutation. And then there's a very interesting result that comes out that says that the variance of the change in the character under this genetic drift can then just be computed. It's, we know it's V sub A over N. Well, we put in this V sub A and cancel, cancel, and what you get is twice the mutational variance. Is the, that is the variance of change in the, that you expect in the character. And that what's interesting is, very interesting fact is, the mutational variance is this presumably the same in large populations as in small. This is the, the mutational variance not totaled over the population, but, but per individual. Um, and so it, what it predicts is the same variance of Brownian motion. Let's see, same variance of Brownian motion. Yeah, the same variance of Brownian motion in a small population as in a large one if each of them has been allowed to come to its equilibrium genetic variance. So a large population will have a bigger genetic variance, a small population, a smaller genetic variance. Um, but since the variance of the character is the genetic variance over the population size, everything cancels out. And so if you're able to make these, if you're able to imagine this process of genetic variance going away by drift and being replenished by mutation and coming to some sort of equilibrium, you have this very interesting result that the resulting Brownian motion, Brownian-like motion of the quantitative trait is going at the same rate in small populations as it is in large, which is kind of, doesn't sound right, but that's what, that's what we get out of this. Okay, multiple characters, you basically go through the same math with matrices, and I'm not going to go through it. Um, you have an additive genetic, um, Additive genetic covariance matrix, that would be Steve's G. I'm calling it A. A mutational covariance matrix, that's M. 
you get the equilibrium is 2n times m, you get the covariance matrix of changes in the characters is twice the mutational covariance. Interesting. Okay. Now I wanted at this point, I, I'm going to see if I can get it going, to show you a computer simulation of genetic drift in two characters that are correlated in a simple model of genetics. What I did is make an R simulation. I've not succeeded in making it an R package. I don't know how easy it is for me ever to distribute it to you. Um, I'll try to see if I can. But let me get into the right Sim. QG Drift. I'm not sure what, whether this is the right one. I got a little behind. Nope. Good. Just a second. I did not do an adequate prep here for. QG drift. Okay, that's it. Okay. We have the following simulation. Um, maybe, where's the light switch? The one on the left. The one on the left. That's it. You're right. Um, we have the following situation. I hope I can erase these. We have a character that has a certain number of loci, L, capital L. And that, that happens to be 10 here. So this is an R, some functions in R. So the, the, the number of loci is 10. And these loci, we have uh, diploid individuals. And there are contributions to the character. We're going to have no dominance. I'm going to make up no dominance. We're going to have alleles, and each allele will have a numerical value, such as 1.3, 0 0.8. Um, there'll, be, there'll be real numbers here that are contributed by those alleles. And what we're going to have is the population size will be 100. It's a population of 100 individuals. They're deployed. They have 10 loci. We are going to have a mutation rate per locus of 0.001 which is pretty high. Um, and one time, once per thousand. It, it's pretty high, but under the diffusion scaling rules, this could be representing a much larger population. Um, under the, uh, each generation, in addition to the usual Mendelian reproduction, these are unlinked loci. They'll, they'll undergo usual Mendelian reproduction. You will mutate each one of these copies with probability 0.001 per copy. So one in a thousand will, will mutate. When it mutates, there will be a, um, a genetic, there will be, I believe it's a, a, a normal a normal, random normal variant added to each one. So its contribution to the character will, will, go, will be increased or decreased by um, a, a normally distributed amount. Let's see if I can uh, do a simulation. Then the other thing to say is there are coefficients called uh, weights x. Let's see if I get that right. I can type. And these are, these are randomly drawn from, I think they're just coefficients randomly drawn between uh, uh, minus 1 and plus 1 uniformly. And what that says is there are 10 loci. These are going to be the contributions of the, 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 of the loci to the x character. There's two characters, x and y. And so what we're saying is that 
Locus 1 is going to make a substantial positive contribution. You'll take the values that are in Locus 1, and, and they'll add. The next locus will have rather little impact on the x character. This will have one. This will have a negative impact. So we've gone along and randomly assigned weight. Some will higher. Uh, if you increase the allele, you increase the character. Some, if you increase the allele, you decrease the character. Some have rather little effect. There's also a weights z, a weights y, sorry, which are independently drawn. So some of these loci higher are going to make contribution, positive contribution to both characters. Some negative to both, some positive to one, not to the other. Some will make very little contribution, like here. So you sort of have a random setup where there's random multipliers as to what each locus does to each character, and it creates a certain amount of genetic covariation between the characters. Now let's just see if I can get this running. I believe that I have to do, let me type a memo because I have a wrote a reminder file to myself of set of generation simrun simrun where is it? It's up there, simrun it's funny, I tried to run it but it didn't do anything, make weights, okay, okay, okay let's just um, G is going to be the number of generations, 100. So I think if I run generations, so it's A. Oh, I see. A is start X, Y. Okay, sorry. A, start X, Y uh, of A. Nope. Sorry, incompetence. OK. Now let's see what happens. So what we have is a character here. Yeah. It's working. Um, Yay. The randomly generated weights that we have, I think I just generated a new set of randomly generated weights predict that variation will go along these two axes. This is phenotype X and phenotype Y. And what we have here is the populations in each generation being shown. So for each individual, we plot its X and Y. And this cloud is the set of 100 individuals of the population. And the green cross is the, uh, the mean of the characters x and y in that generation. And what you will see, so what you want to see is, first of all, the genetic covariation, because all, I should say, all the covariation here is genetic. I, I think I didn't have any environmental variants. It's all just additive genetic. And you'll see how, what kind of genetic covariation you get, and you'll see which directions does this cross wander? So if I, I think, for example, uh, if I do that again, I believe we're starting over. So what you're seeing here is, um, I think it starts from a homogeneous, from a completely inbred population. And genetic variance is building up. Doing to the, uh, owing to the mutation. And as that happens, the green cross is wandering. In this case, it is more or less wandering up and down the long axis that you would predict. And that's based on this process that we talked about, where you have mutational variants coming in and creating additive genetic variants, and then drift based on that. That's what we're seeing here. If I do a different case, Let's wait till this one. You can see the, the, the time is up there. Okay. If I do a different case, let me close that. Let me do A is start X, Y of A, and then do generations A. Now we, now we have a different case with different weights. We're going to get different axes. Well, they're not very different. Um, oh, I know what's happened. I'm sorry. I think I can. I'm going to. I'm going to actually kill this. I'm trying to kill it. <laughs> you go to the console and hit escape. 
Let's let it finish. <laughs> it, it doesn't want to be killed. What, what happens? I, I, I misspoke. Um, I'm using the same weights throughout. There's a make weights function, and I didn't, I didn't execute a new make weights function. If I execute a new make weights function, I make another set of weights for the loci, um, and then you'll get different axes, and then you get to see if you, if you go along those axes. Uh, a hand being raised in search of a microphone. Okay, now while you're talking, I'm going to... Uh, so the weights, those help define, it's going to create a covariance, right? It'll, it'll create a new scheme of which loci contribute to which characters. So, so you've got five, was it five loci, ten loci? Ten loci. Okay, so if one had like a, if uh, for trait X it had one for one set and then one for another, this would be a high covariance, that lo the loci one would be expected to have a high covariance, right? Yeah, I mean, here I just did a make weights. And I said, here are the weights that came out. These are the new weights, the new set of weights, different from what I just showed you. Here are the expected co variances and covariances that you would see among the characters based on those weights. OK. And so then the axes basic um, principal component one and two predicted. They are the principal components of that, the, the, the principal axes of the ellipse for that covariance matrix. Okay, so now we'll do, um, so we'll start and we'll do, I think actually if I don't do the start, it doesn't start over but will continue. Anyway, now hmm, we seem to have got axes that are pretty much the same. Sorry? Yeah, I think. And anyway, in this case, it actually seems to have more variance going this way. Um, so once again, you'll see variation accumulates. The drift is more in this direction than it is in that direction. Uh, so anyway, this is just a simple, to show you a simple example of the kind of process that we imagine when we talk about mutational input into a population, creating genetic covariation, um, which reflects the mutational input. Um, and of genetic drift then proceeding more in the directions in which there is mutational variation because that's where also the additive genetic covariance is. So this is intended mostly to uh, motivate that. I didn't quite handle things right to get you a new set of different axes, but let, I'm going to have to go back to the projection uh, and finish off. Okay. So. Um, we have, nope, try again. Okay, so, okay. Now, you've heard this before from Steve. Um, the, in quantitative genetics, as we explained in the opening lecture, there's a thing called the breeder's equation, which is the selection response equation. And it just is that the change of the character due to selection is the selection differential S times the heritability. That goes back to the 1920s and was publicized by Jay Lush. Here's Russ Landy, uh, whose name you have already heard, who in the mid-70s took this quantitative genetic theory and said, let's apply it to natural populations. Uh, and I, I jokingly accused Russ at the time of basing his entire career on the assertion that the heritability is 0.3 now and will remain that for the next million years. Okay. And um, that's a nasty remark. Uh, and I now find I regret it because it's undermining our whole course. Uh, we're, ha we're dependent upon the, the very things that Russ assumed back in the 70s, which is that there could be some kind of an equilibrium genetic variance under these processes and that we can project forward considerable amounts of time making those equilibrium assumptions. And the, the whole issue in this course, which you have to decide for yourself, is whether this in fact works. Because we've got two bodies of theories in this course. We have the short-term quantitative genetics, a coherent theory, 
We have the long-term Brownian motion on trees stuff. The interesting question is, are they able to successfully interdigitate? And it's just at this point in the course that we try to cross that uh, connection between the two bodies of theory. Uh, you've already actually heard this, that there are these versions that Russ made of the breeder's equation in which uh, he can express the, um, the selection differential in terms of the phenotypic variance that was being called P in, in Steve's math and the slope of the mean fitness as a function of the mean uh, population, uh, of a population mean. Um, and you can recast that a little bit, that the response is equal to the genetic, this is for single variable, the genetic, the, the heritability times that selection differential. And what it ends up with is that this slope gets multiplied by the additive genetic variance. That's in one character. Um, and there's optimum selection. And I, I kind of don't have to go over this. If you make a Gaussian-shaped optimum selection, and you have a, a parameter for selection I'm calling V sub S here is the one called, that uh, Steve called omega. And the result, when you busily multiply um, normal distributions together, do integrals and, and complete squares, uh, the result that you get is very straightforward. Steve already showed it to you, um, that the response, that the change of mean is this fraction times the distance the mean is from the optimum. In other words, the, the change of mean it always goes under this scheme a certain fraction of the way to the optimum, which means it's going to go more at first and then less and less and less if the optimum sits there. Um, and this Steve gave you this exact equation only in his g over g plus omega, no, sorry, g over p plus omega, um, and that's just my different notation for it. Um, okay, now here is a big point. We've seen that the covariation of characters due to um, the, the covariation of changes in characters is from the genetic covariance. But there's another source. And this is, this is um, important to know. And it's frequently ignored when people talk about this. They say, um, yeah, genetic covariance. If I see two characters changing in a correlated way, they'll say, yeah, that must be that they're a pli that's pleiotropy, it's genetic covariance. Pleiotropy being the same thing here as genetic covariance, um, or leading to genetic covariance. But there's another thing, which is, is selective covariance. Okay. Um, and selective covariance, which is due to the Swedish animal breeder Olaf Tedim in 1926, and George, George uh, not George Kaylord Simpson, Ledyard, G. Ledyard Stebbins in 1950. Stebbins pointed to what Tedim had done. That is, correlated change in characters could occur either because they're genetically correlated or because there are correlated selection pressures. There is covariation in the direction that selection wants them to go. And in order to get a, a, a quick feel for that second source of phylogenetic covariation, covariation in, in evolutionary change, let me, let me make a uh, somewhat uh, fanciful example. Let's imagine that we have a tree and two lineages on the tree have entered the Arctic. So let's say these are mammals. And uh, two of them have gone, have uh, changed their range and are now in the, in the Arctic. And we find that these three characters, size, fur color, and limb length, are changing. And they're changing in a correlated way. They're, the organisms are getting bigger, they're getting darker, and they're having relatively shorter limb lengths. Okay. Now, a person staring at that and saying, oh, yes, those must be pleiotropic. There must be a uh, genetic variation that's common to those traits would be making a mistake. There might be. But these are what are called Bergman's, Allen's, and Globler's rules. Uh, they're generalizations about the kinds of changes you might find in uh, uh, mammalian phenotypes. And they predict 
that organisms going into live, to live in the Arctic want to be bigger, to lose less heat. They want relatively shorter limbs, again, to lose less heat. And they, except for cases where they're trying to be cryptic against the snow, they want to be darker so that they will absorb more solar radiation. Um, so those are selective covariants in action. There doesn't need to be any genetic covariation in order to have those traits change in a covariant fashion. And uh, I think discussions of all of this tend to underplay that. Now, if you think about where does that come up in the machinery we've seen so far involving adaptive landscapes or uh, fitness surfaces or uh, uh, adaptive topographies, whatever you want to call them, and it comes up in the motion of the peak. Because in effect, what this is saying is the peaks for the, the, the peaks for all three, the peak involving all three characters has moved in the direction of greater size, darker color, and shorter limb length in this lineage and also in that lineage. And the covariance of change that you see is due to both following peaks that are moving in a similar direction. So this can be connected to all this peak motion stuff that we've been talking about. OK, now that leads us to say, well, what can we, and this will connect directly to Paul's talk. Um, what can we hope to do with all this? Um, you, we might be able to infer additive genetic covariances by doing quantitative genetics breathing experiments. And in the examples Paul gave, that had been done with garter snakes. Um, and that's an unusual thing to do because I think right now for multi-species data, many of you have multi-species data, uh, you know that you don't, a lot of you don't have um, quantitative genetic experiments. Let, let me say, do a show of hands. I'm sorry if it embarrasses you. How many people here have multi-species data? A whole bunch. How many of you have quantitative genetic experiments on those multi-species data? Well, that's pretty good. That's not quite half. OK, so you, you're, but this is a self-selected group. Uh, you came to this course. <laughs> uh, this is I, the future. This is the future, yeah. yeah. OK. And the other ones are, of course, going to do the genetic experiments. So they, too, will be in the future. And one thing you can do is you can imagine taking the additive genetic covariances and choosing new axes that are independent that have equal variances, which you can always do when you estimate covariation. And so you can imagine changing your characters into characters that, that all had equal genetic variation and they were all independent of each other. But then if you watch them move on the tree and you didn't find that they moved according to, the, according to that rule, but moved preferentially in certain directions, you would be very tempted to say selective covariance is, a, is, is in action. And of course, that's exactly what Paul's testing framework was trying to do, to say, do we see motions along the, additive gen the axes of the additive genetic variation, or is it doing something else? So, so uh, that's where that fits in. Um, I wanted to show you a simple numerical example, um, which now what I did here was have a population chasing a peak that's moving. The genetic covariation I put in was along this axis, mostly along this axis. It was much bigger this way than it was that way. So the mutational variation that's input and the resulting genetic covariation wants the trait to go this way. But there's a, an, a, a selective optimum which starts right here. And it is going to do a, its own Brownian motion. Rem remember that when you're talking about Brownian motion of a selective peak, you aren't necessarily talking about a biological process. It might be the weather. Um, and we're modeling it by Brownian motion, but uh, who knows? Uh, but I'm, I'm going to imagine the peak wanders mostly this way. And what I show you here is the first 100 generations. that, I, And I simply had the population moving a certain fraction of the distance towards the peak. 
taking the genetic covariation into account. It's easier for the population to move in this direction. It's harder for it to move in that direction. Nevertheless, it's following the peak. And when you do that, the first 100 generations, you see variation that kind of follows the genetic variation. But the peak is moving too. And as that happens, things start to round out. This is the first uh, every tenth generation up the this is a hundred generations selected from the first thousand. And this is a hundred generations selected from the first ten thousand generations. And what you see really is, yeah, the population is varying this way a lot, but it's also following the peak. And in spite of the genetic variation favoring movement in this direction, in the end, the population goes where the peak goes. And I think all that has been mentioned already you know, by Steve. Uh, in the course, but I just wanted to show you this, this simple uh, genetic, this simple example. I can, I can cast, I think we're almost done, but I can cast um, the whole thing, I can derive an interesting equation from the breeder's equation. Here's the breeder's equation, here's the matrix version of it. Now I'm using notation more like Steve's notation. If you take this equation and transpose it, so you make a transpose of this times transpose of that times transpose of that times transpose of that. The G and P are symmetrical so that when you transpose them, they don't change. And you multiply them by each other. That's all I did. You get this thing. You say, what's this? It's the, it's the covariances of change. It's the... the it's the, the expectation of that is the covariance of change. It's the product of changes in, in characters. There's that covariance. What is it equal to? This thing, if you take the expectations through, these are treated as constants, and this is varying, the selection pressure. So what it's really saying is here's an expression that has heritability, like you know, genetic covariation-like stuff, genetic covariation, phenotypic covariation on both sides, and in the middle is the selective covariation. So there's actually a, a simple-minded expression for the, the overall phenotypic, the overall change along phylogenies uh, being a function both of the genetic covariation and the selective covariation. Um, it's a kind of cute equation. At the moment it doesn't have much application, but I think with frameworks like Paul's and with the work that some of you are busy doing, this will become more of a reality. Um, okay, this is I just said what I just said, which is we can hope that after we do genetics breeding experiments um, and back calculate from the covariances along the phylogeny what the selective covariances might be. So the hope is we can get some insight into uh, which directions selection, selective peaks are moving, for example. Um, okay, uh, I'll just finish off with one minor point, and then we can do a little discussion, and then we can go eat. Um, all of these models have been models of, that are gradualistic in the sense that there are processes of movement of peaks and processes of, of quantitative genetic, uh, genetic drift that are going on all the time. But of course, there are quite a few people in paleontology who like to talk about punctuated equilibrium processes. And they say, well, no. They think, in their view, that a new species goes through a bottleneck and will have a burst of change, might find its way to new selective peaks. And then after that, there'll be a selective peak, and you'll be hanging around it, and there'll be relative stasis. So I started thinking about, what would such a model look like on a phylogeny? So I imagined a, a randomly branching phylogeny. And then I said, well, what it's going to do is that in each lineage, when the lineage starts out, there'll be a burst of change. And let's take it to have a kind of constant. It's like a constant amount of branch length. It'll be a constant um, input. It'll be like so and so many generations of, of uh, drift and or selection. So here is a tree that originally is a clock-like tree. But what I've done is rescale the branch length so every new at each speciation event, one of the two lineages undergoes a branch. That was the classic punctuated equilibrium um, 
argument that said at the moment of speciation, they felt it was the new species that would go for a bottleneck and do some and, and change its phenotype. The old species wouldn't change very much. So here I made a tree that shows that. Now this is a punctuated tree. You might think, I just want to make one little point. You might think that you could look at trees, estimate branch lengths from the phenotypic characters, and look to see if you've got a, pro uh, a pattern like this. And I just want to make the point that, yes, there's hope of doing that, but only if you're seeing all of the descendants of the original ancestor. Because if you go in there and say, well, suppose either by extinction or by, um, or by us not looking at all, all species in the group, we just take 10 of those species. If I take 10 of those and just extract that part of the tree from that tree, now I get a tree that's got some of this punctuated stuff, but it's also got some stuff that's not punctuated. Here's a speciation, and this lineage changes, and so does that. And you might think, wait a second, the original process didn't allow that. The answer is there were more speciations on this guy may be the descendant of two more speciations in here. So it changed, and this one might have been the new species, and it changed. So you get some non-punctuated pattern if you sample tips out of a punctuated tree. So anyway, that's really all I wanted to say in this lecture. Uh, here are, here's a review of uh, phylogenies and quantitative characters in which I, I do talk about many of these issues some other similar stuff. Here's Russell Andes, some of his very important uh, papers of the 1970s. Um, and, yeah, the genetic covariance between characters maintained by plot. This is where the, the phenotypic mutation, uh, <coughs> sorry, the mutational input matrix affects the genetic covariance. Um, Michael Lynch and Bill Hill have worked on uh, neutral mutation and what kind of uh, uh, covariation that would cause. Here's Ledyard, Sevens, and Tadine, and uh, uh, it was publicized again in 1996 by Scott Armbruster, uh, who gave a, a good good discussion. Okay, um, I think we were supposed to go to lunch at what time? 12 or 12:15? 12 12:15. 12 okay, we have X number of minutes, small number of minutes, but we do have some time for discussion. So I'm going to stop recording and. Uh, let you bother me about this, please. <laughs>